the hell are you? A remnant of a time long past. There has been an awakening. It's the Riley and Kimmy Show. Have you felt it? Well, hello out there. It's me, Winnie the Pooh. And don't forget to remember to stay tuned to the Riley and Kimmy Show. And don't forget to remember to keep on bouncing, says Tigger. <laughs> And we're bouncing on episode 431 of the Riley and Kimmy Show. I am your host, Patrick Riley. Right next to me is the person who is the best bouncer in the entire room. That's right. She's actually the one who's the dancer, and that is... Kimmy! I got one name! Kimmy! And welcome to the Riley and Kimmy Show, and uh, I'm glad you made it, Kimmy. I'm glad you're part of episode 431. Thank you. And we have a lot of things planned on this episode. We're going to uh, do a tribute... To someone for International Women's Day, which is underway, if you're listening to the day this episode was uploaded. A big time, influential female in entertainment, one who was in films, radio, and big in TV. Any clue who it might be, Kimmy? Oh, I don't know. Agnes Moorhead. No, somebody oh. even bigger than that. Bigger than that. Yes. Any mm. other clue? Well, we'll have the answer coming up here on episode 431 of the Riley and Kimmy Show. Now, just the other day, we were on assignment. Well, sort of. We were we were going everywhere, visiting all of our nerd friends and non-nerd friends throughout Central Florida, and we ended up in Deland, Florida. Next thing you know, they'll be on motorcycles wearing them leather jackets and zooming around. They'll take over the whole town, a rain of terror. The Deland Bike Rally was underway when we visited our friends at carousels collectibles in downtown deland we saw jim and terry at the store and what a fun event was happening there wasn't it mm-hmm. yeah we basically we didn't have to go over to daytona beach where the uh, bike week is underway right now it it came right to us mm-hmm. we got a little taste of it right there that's right if you want to see videos and also photos that i took at the event and kimmy took some as well uh, we have, you know, of course, a lot of motorcycles there, Harleys and other types, and some vintage automobiles, too. And one of them that really popped up and caught my eye is a vintage station wagon. That was really cool. It, You know what I want? Why I'd want a car like that? Mm-hmm. It's for my big dog, Lockjaw. Mm-hmm. I think he would just love to be in the back of uh, a classic station wagon. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe I should try to find one that, like... The Brady Bunch had. Didn't they have a station wagon? Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Brady had two cars, didn't he? He had a station wagon and he had that convertible of his. Oh. Remember? Mr. Brady had the convertible. Because that is the car that was used. Wasn't that the car they used was the convertible for the, uh, where they had to hit the thing and not hit the thing where uh, Marsha and her brother were in that contest and whoever got the closest without bumping something would win? Remember that? Nope. Kimmy, I thought you (laughs) saw all those episodes. Over and over again. I'm, you know what I'm talking about. How dare you do that? Anyhow, go right to our website at RileyAtKimmy.com and you can see the classic station wagon that caught my eye. And I think it caught Kimmy's eye as mm-hmm. well. And it was a good time meeting everybody and seeing everyone, seeing uh, Terry at uh, Carousel's Collectibles, talking to him about music. He's just a big time uh, music freak and that's always fun. And... I took a picture of something that I've talked about before on the Riley and Kimmy show. And my friend, I tell you, I never know what I'm going to find when I walk into Carousel's Collectibles. And he did it again uh, over a couple of times we've talked about on uh, the Riley and Kimmy show about records, music that was available on cereal boxes way back. And Mm -hmm. you would cut these records out or punch them out of the back of the cereal box and then plop them in a record player or on top of a record player or a turntable and drop a needle and listen to music or Mm -hmm. whatever spoken word message was there. And the first one I ever, uh, that I remember, was on the back of a Honeycombs uh, box of cereal, and I didn't like Honeycombs, Uh, but it was Sugar Sugar by Hmm. the Archies. Okay. And then also had, I I can't, I tried to pull it up. I don't know if it was, it was one of the Beatles songs. I don't remember if it was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds or... Or something, I just can't remember which, but it was on the back of Super Sugar Crisp. Mm. Those, okay. are, those are the two that pop out in my mind. I've never been able to find these, okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm kind of looking for one, or both, or different ones. But Jim had, he had three. He had, you know, disc one, two, and three. 
And I think those were off Life Serial mm -hmm. that he found. And I took a picture of those. And it's actually a pretty cool shot I did that I took of this thing, which was unintentional. Because I had a, a photographer, a pretty cool photographer, contact me on social media. He's like, wow, that was pretty cool. <laughs> Good either. And I'm sitting there going, that's totally accidental. <laughs> I just plopped him down and took a shot. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was. It was total, total accident. Now, if you want to see what I'm talking about with that, just go right to our website, which is RileyandKimmy.com. That mm -hmm. was a pretty cool time, wasn't it? Uh -huh. And that was all happening in downtown DeLand during the big bike rally and of course there were a lot of motorcycles around every piece of equipment and wardrobe has a specific function helmet any crash goggles any foreign objects in eyes that is gravel and or bugs <laughs> i see what's them leather gauntlets for to protect you from dogs that think you look funny i'm sorry barney i'm sorry i guess all that stuff is necessary on a high speed motorcycle like that it sure is you know my father he said that about motorcycles. Yeah. That's how he called a motorcycle. That's what motorcycle? Yeah. Did your dad do that? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. I don't know why my dad did that. He wasn't, you know, from, well, he wasn't from where Andy Griffith was from, let's put it that way. And it just drove me nuts <laughs> that he'd do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if it was on purpose or not. I, I, to this day, I remember when I uh, first got my first bike, a Suzuki, and, he's, and he was calling it my motorcycle. <laughs> It's a motorcycle, you fool. <laughs> I mean, we got a big, big spat about that. And I just don't know if he was being cute or not with that one. Okay. So I was kind of curious if your father did that. I don't think so. Oh, okay. He said some words, you know, and in a different way. But uh, I don't to think be, that was one of them. To be funny? I don't think so. He was a Iowa person, right? Instead of yes. Iowa. In Missouri. Yes. Instead of Missouri. That's probably two of them. And what, Sonaco? Uh Amoco. Oh, that was it. I was trying to remember. Uh, I was trying to think of the ones my dad did. It would probably be similar. Yeah, that's that's pretty much about about the same. Now, one of the things we did after uh, returning from, well, after having a fantastic uh, dinner and visiting one of our friends in Sanford, Florida, uh, we what well, you purchased a movie, and the reason you did was because of the Academy Awards. We did not see it in the theater, and you knew I was a big fan of who this movie was about, mm -hmm. and that is well, the movie is. The theory of everything. If Einstein is right, right if general relativity is correct, then yes. the universe is expanding, yes? Yes. Okay, so if you reverse time, then the universe is getting smaller. All right. So what if I reverse the process all the way back to see what happened at the beginning of time itself? At the beginning of time itself? Yes. So the universe getting smaller and smaller, getting denser and denser, hotter and hotter. Well, you as mean we wind back the clock? Yeah, exactly, wind back the clock. Wind back the clock. Is that what you're doing? <laughs> you're winding back the clock. That is what I'm doing. <laughs> well, keep winding. I know. You've got quite a long way to go. Keep winding. I don't want to fall in. Well, you've got to go back to the beginning of time. You've got a long way to go. Well, keep winding. Keep winding. Until you get... A singularity. space-time singularity. So the universe born from a black hole exploding. And then, of course, we have chapter four, this black hole at the beginning of time. Space-time singularity. Indeed. It's brilliant. Brilliant, Stephen. Superb. Now, Kimmy, out of curiosity, did you like that film? Yes, I did. You uh, so you're really happy that you that you purchased it and you mm -hmm. own it. Now it's, it's interesting because this is one where you actually paid full blown price for a, a uh, DVD. You didn't see it first in the theater, mm -hmm. so I was kind of curious. You know, are you happy that you bought this thing? Mm -hmm. And I actually think it's a a great film to see, regardless if you're a fan of S Stephen Hawking or not. Maybe you don't know of him. Maybe you've been sheltered, or you're not familiar with him because of Big Bang Theory. Or maybe you are familiar because of the Big Bang Theory, or maybe you're just a nerd like I am, and you've known about him for a long time, and maybe you've read his material in the past. Um, regardless, it is a very good movie. It is uh, something that I think that would inspire anybody uh, just to see that, and I, I recommend it, especially if you know somebody's going through a bad time, you know, a bad bout of things, and for some reason they are, you know, what was me. I think they need to see this film. Mm -hmm. I think it might put things in perspective and you see an individual with a brilliant mind who has not given up mm -hmm. and is still contributing, still 
expressing himself and still sharing with others and having a life. And he did not give up. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the message really more than anything. Yes. And, I, you know, I, I do recommend that. And you know what's interesting? The director who made the film, uh, one of the things, actually the film is more about her than him in ways. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize that. It's really her story, not his. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. So it's, uh, you know, something if you have not, not picked up, do so. We highly recommend that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a, a very good thing. Now, moving over to something kind of fun here, Kimmy, with uh, this episode being uploaded on the day of International Women's Day, Spotify has compiled a list of the most streamed female artists on the music site okay mm -hmm. we have the entire list the full list right on our website at rileyandkimmy.com my question for you kimmy is let's see can you do number one and how many can you do on that top 10 list of the most listened to female artists among all spotify listeners worldwide that means men and women well taylor swift taylor swift is at number nine how about Katy perry Katy Perry comes in at number two. Ooh. Uh, Beyonce? Number three. Hmm. Mm. I'm stuck. Oh, come on. Name some popular female. Madonna. Madonna does not make the top, yeah, I top didn't, ten. Didn't think so. No. You're missing somebody. Mm, I, I can't. I know I'm missing somebody really big. Yeah. You saw one of these perform just recently. On the Academy Awards. Lady Gaga? Lady Gaga, number five. Mm. And you you like number one. You've mentioned number one to me many times. Really? Yes, number one. You you do know. Mm-hmm. Nope. Oh. Yes. I don't know. Matter of fact, number one has been the most streamed woman for the third year in a row. Third. I'm going to kick myself. I, I Third year in a row. I'll give you a clue. Had a smash hit with her Eminem collaboration. Rihanna. The Monster last year. Rihanna. Yes. By the way, that song has been streamed over 200 million times on Spotify. Mm. 200 million times. She is the top. And if you want to find out all the rest, we have them right on our website at RileyandKimmy.com. So, uh, you, did, you didn't do that bad. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, I think you did really good. Matter of fact, we proved just how knowledgeable you are with music. I've told people, matter of fact, I told Terry, our friend Terry at uh, Carousel's Collectibles when we visited, that you would be my lifeline for music category on Millionaire, who wants to be a millionaire. Mm -hmm. And you were able to identify music that he was playing on the laptop. Mm -hmm. Almost in like, a couple of notes, maybe one or two. It was kind of frightening. Okay. I'm, I mean, you, you're frightening. Yeah. You're frightening. That's a gift. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is go right to our phone lines and check in with one of our friends, a friend who needs all of our help. Let's go to the phone lines to the Riley and Kimmy show. Hello. Hey, Riley and Kimmy. This is David, the commissioner, calling from Smash Comics and Games in Sanford. As, uh, as you may know, I've briefly run into a spot of bad luck with my health. I uh, went into the emergency room for an infection in my foot, and I had uh, septic blood, and they also found a uh, heart problem with a clot in my heart. So after spending nearly a month in the hospital, I get home to find out that my roommate, uh, who shall not be named, <laughs> is moving out in uh, five days, which actually turned out to be two, so with no notice. So I sort of got stranded here. Uh, with double the bills and a lot of hospital money running in. Uh, and uh, at the moment, not being able to go to work, no income to pay for it. So I've already eaten through my savings. So I put a GoFundMe up on, on the Internet by asking for donations. Uh, I'm, I'm a, a proud person. I don't usually like to ask for help, but right now I certainly need it. So uh, I believe uh, the Riley and Kimmy Show has a link to my GoFundMe on the page. Um, that you can go check out, and if you uh, can do anything to help out, 
I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much, and thank you, uh, Riley and Kimmy. Keep up the good shows. Bye-bye. Thank you, David. Uh, we deeply appreciate that. One of the things uh, we did when we were out and about visiting friends the other day, we were talking about going to DeLand and Sanford, and when we were in Sanford, we stopped by Smash Comics and Games. That is where David is co-owner of, and we've been friends with Smash forever. But one of the things that I find sad, one of the things that is missing from Smash is David's smiling face, David's warmth and, and, and friendliness, uh, just his vibe uh, that's in the story. It's, it's deeply missed, uh, at least for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if you feel the same way, Katie. I do, yes. And he definitely needs our help. He needs your help. Uh, he's a person who's done so much work for charities and stuff in Central Florida, a uh, big, big supporter of Toys for Tots as an example. Um, and he's went out of his way to help others like in the Heroes Initiative and things like that. And it's our turn to, well, be a superhero for David because he's definitely a super friend. And if you'd like to find out more about his GoFundMe project, his needs and stuff, go right to our website, which is Riley and Kimmy. Dot com. Now, being International Women's Day, which we've been talking about here, and I thought, you know, what we do is do a, a tribute and, you know, for International Women's Day with somebody who is huge in entertainment, Kimmy. I mean big in radio, in film, but even bigger on television. Is it Lucy? It is Lucy. I figured that'd be the Bob, probably one of the you know most influential multimedia individuals of the 20th century to uh, take a look at mm-hmm. and in honor of International Women's Day. And one of the ways to do that is something that was actually way before I Love Lucy. And it was a show that is I Love Lucy. It is exactly what I Love Lucy modeled itself after. And one of the reasons uh, you can say this is because three of the writers, the three the three prime writers from this old-time radio show were brought on for the I Love Lucy project. And Lucy actually worked things out for that concept of I Love Lucy with this radio program. And you can hear just, you know, everything except Desi there because she didn't have Desi as her husband on the radio program. And the program was called My Favorite Husband. And it was the name of an American radio program and network television series eventually. And yeah, it became I Love Lucy. Now, the original radio show co-starred Lucille Ball was an initial basis for what evolved into the groundbreaking TV sitcom I Love Lucy. The series was based on the novels Mr. and Mrs. Cougat, The Record of a Happy Marriage, which, uh, by the way, from 1940 and Outside Eden from 1940. And they were made into films as well in 42, uh, actually a film in 1942, co-starring Ray Milland and Betty Field. Now, My Favorite Husband began on CBS Radio with Lucille Ball and Richard Denning as Liz and George Cougat. After at least 20 early episodes, confusion with band leader Xavier Cougat prompted a name change to Liz and George Cooper. Now, the cheerful couple lived at 321 Bundy Drive in the fictitious city of Sheridan Falls and were billed as two people who live together and like it. And the program was highly successful and eventually was being courted for TV, but Lucy said, hey, I'm I'm not going to do it unless you uh, put Desi in there. And she stomped her foot down, basically, and very strong-willed, and it happened, and Desi became part of it, and it is legendary. It's history. And we, mm-hmm. you know, But we wouldn't have had the I Love Lucy show, in my opinion, if we hadn't had My Favorite Husband. So I thought we'd go back in time and, you know, being International Women's Day, we'd pay tribute to Lucille Ball. Going back to March 24th, 1950, here's My Favorite Husband on the Riley and Kimmy Show. It's time for My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball. Hello, everybody. <laughs> It's the Gay Family Series, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning, transcribed and brought to you by the Jell-O family of desserts. J-E-L-L-O, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. Oh, the big red letters stand for the Jell-O family. That's Jell-O. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O pudding. Yum, yum, yum. Jell-O tap. The Oka pudding just a ring. 
And now Lucille Ball with Richard Denning as Liz and George Cooper. Two people who live together and like it. As we look in on the Coopers tonight, George is just coming home for dinner after a hard day's work. Hi, honey, I'm home. Oh, hello, George. Give me a kiss. Oh, boy, am I glad the day's over. I'm going to take a nice hot shower and pile into bed. Oh, George, we're going to dinner at the Atterbury's. Oh, I forgot. Can't we get out of it? No, no, they're having us over to meet somebody, a, a writer. Is Iris on a culture kick again? Oh, she's like a cat, always dragging home dead literary birds. <laughs> well, she says this writer's very famous and interesting. Ah, writers are all alike. What do you bet this one will be an opinionated jerk in baggy tweeds with a smelly pipe and a beard? I'll bet you a million dollars this one is a woman. <laughs> well, I suppose we'll have to go and spend a boring evening. What's her... its name? Margaret Baldwin. Margaret Baldwin? Mm-hmm. Baldwin? Hey, not old Maggie Baldwin. I went to college with her. Oh? <laughs> well, do you think it's the same one? I'll bet it is. Maggie was always writing poetry for the school magazine, and she was editor of the yearbook. Sure, it's the same one. Hmm. <laughs> well, I imagine she's the homely, intellectual type. Oh, ho, 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 not Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind backing up a few words? I don't like the tone of your oh-ho-ho-ho. Ho, ho. <laughs> uh, that Maggie was quite a dish. Besides being brilliant, she was a gorgeous blonde. You know, George, I think you're right. This might be a very boring evening. <laughs> oh, I don't know, Liz. As you say, it won't hurt me to absorb a little culture once in a while. Uh, yeah, but you're tired, George. Uh, she... Gee, I wonder if good old Maggie's changed. If you're that tired, George, let's stay home. <laughs> no, no, this will be interesting. I, I better go put on a clean shirt. Oh, you don't have to. Oh, it's no trouble. <laughs> <laughs> now what's the matter? You didn't put on a clean shirt last night when you went out to dinner with me. <laughs> Before we go in, Liz, I want you to promise me something. Liz. Oh, now stop acting like a child. I want you to promise me you'll behave and not make any smart aleck remarks to Miss Baldwin. Oh, I'll behave, Daddy. <laughs> Liz. I'll only take one piece of cake, and when I go home, I'll curtsy and say, I had a very nice time at your party. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, hi, Mr. Atterbury. George boy, Liz girl, come in. Come in. Hi, Uncle Rudolph. <laughs> Is Miss Blank verse here yet? Uh, she and I are upstairs. They'll be right down. Say, I went to school with uh, Margaret Baldwin. I, I wonder if it's the same one. What's she look like? Oh, uh, she's quite a girl, boy. <laughs> A girl boy. <laughs> she used to be real good looking. Yeah, she still is. Wait till you get a load of her iambic pentameter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet it's died. <laughs> Liz, iambic pentameter is... Oh, never mind. Seem to be here. Well, I'm anxious to see if it's the same George that... George Cooper! It is you, isn't it? Maggie! Maggie Baldwin! <sighs> <Yeah. laughs> Just stand there, 
there, George, and let me look at you. Uh, Miss Baldwin, this is Mrs. Cooper. How do you Oh, do? George, dear, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> I'm very pleased. That and... same wicked glint in your eye I used to think so horrid. That same carefree, unruly curl on your forehead. Well. <laughs> but isn't Edgar Guest? <laughs> I beg your pardon. Uh, Miss Baldwin, this is Mrs. Cooper. Oh, yes, Maggie. Uh, this is my wife, Liz. Your wife? Well, I always wondered what kind of a girl George would marry. Let me look at you. <laughs> well, now, just a minute. Liz? Rudolph, do something. Talk about her book. Uh, uh, Miss Baldwin, I've been meaning to tell you I certainly enjoyed your book. Oh, Really, Mr. Atterbury, I didn't suppose you'd read it. Most men don't care for poetry. Oh, I enjoyed it all right. And gad, what a provocative title. Did you really think so? <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I haven't read the book. Uh, what was the title, Mr. Atterbury? Uh... <laughs> uh yes, yes. yes. So, let Miss Baldwin tell you. She can say it with more meaning than I can. <laughs> What was the title, Maggie? Poem. <laughs> Dad, that is provocative. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Cooper. And if you ever write a sequel to it, I've got a smash title for you. You can call it More Poems. <laughs> Something about you judging a playwriting contest on the local radio station? Oh, yes. The purpose of my trip is really to stimulate interest in the art of writing. This radio contest is a helping hand we professionals lend to beginners. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Very sporting. <laughs> I'm also giving a lecture at Town Hall on how to get the most out of Kipling. <laughs> I knew she kippled the minute I saw her. Liz. Now, uh, tell me, Maggie, yes? uh, what have you been doing all these years? Oh, exciting, vital things. I've been to Europe five times. No. Yes. Something keeps pulling me back to Paris. What'd you do, get your girdle caught on the Eiffel Tower? <laughs> George, I've continued my education, too. Now, it's Margaret Baldwin, Ph.D. Ph.D.? You know what that means, Liz? Yes, Margaret Baldwin, Fudd. <laughs> no, no. No, it means she's a doctor. Yes, that's right. Oh, say, I'm glad you're here, Doc. I sure feel rotten. <laughs> Elizabeth? my throat, will you? Uh... Uh, but I think we'd better go into dinner. I think so, too. Uh, Maggie, will you take my arm? Oh, thank you. My arm, Lotus Bud. Oh, thank you, Rudolph. Will you take my arm, Liz? What, that skinny old thing? <laughs> well, all right. Ow! Oh, not so tight, you're pinching. <laughs> That was a nice, silent ride home. Now, I hope you're satisfied with the way you acted tonight. Frankly, I'm amazed that you'd be so jealous. You wish you were married to her. Oh, I do not. You do, too. Oh, stop it. I don't want to be married to a brilliant, intellectual woman. I want to be married to you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it the way it sounded. I love you. <laughs> well, I don't blame you for being attracted to her. But don't forget, I gave up my writing career to devote myself to marriage. Your writing career? Yes. I used to write, and well, too. You may not know it, but you're looking at the president of the Short Ridge High School Scroll and Quill Club. 
<laughs> oh, is that all? Is that all? I won the senior class essay contest. I was on my way to becoming a shining literary light. Well, what happened? I married you and cut off my current. <laughs> I apologize to posterity. I gained a wife and the world lost a great writer. You don't believe me, do you? Well, I still have a copy of that essay in my scrapbook. I'll show you. Oh, Liz, I'm tired. Right here. Here it is. Thoughts of a graduating senior. <clears throat> As graduation approaches, there is a lump in my throat. My head is in the clouds. But my feet are on the ground as I stand at the crossroads, looking backwards and facing the future with a smile. <laughs> huh. You were quite a contortionist in those days. George Cooper, are you laughing at me? <laughs> no, I'm not laughing. <laughs> well, go ahead, laugh. They laughed at Robert Fulton, too, you know. Robert Fulton? What did he write? You think I don't know, huh? Showboat. <laughs> I'm sorry I laughed, Liz, but let's face it. You never were a writer and you never will be. Oh, yes, I was and oh, yes, I will be. I'll show you. Oh, forget it, honey. No, no, no. This is a challenge. I'm going to enter that radio writing contest your girlfriend is going to sponsor. What do you think of that? <laughs> Yeah, well, you'll laugh out of the other side when I win that contest. You're looking at Liz Cooper, radio's answer to television. <laughs> Turn to the Coopers, we find Liz anxiously waiting for a phone call which will tell her whether she won the radio script writing contest or not. Oh, I wish they'd hurry and call, George. I haven't left this telephone all day. Oh, there it is. That's them. I've won. Where's the telephone? Where's the telephone, George? Where's the phone? In your hands. You're running around the room with it. Oh. Hello? Oh, it's them, George. Yes? Yes? This is Elizabeth Shakespeare. Shakespeare? I use the pen name. <laughs> what? I did. I am. Oh, George, I won. I'm one of three finalists. Good. Out of how many? Out of how many? Oh. Uh, tomorrow night, huh? Yes, yes, I'll be there. Oh, thank you. Goodbye. Oh, George, I can't believe it. They're going to put the three best scripts on the air tomorrow night and then pick the winner. And I came in third. Out of how many? <laughs> Imagine me having my script done on the air. Out of how many? Liz, how many scripts were submitted? Three. <laughs> oh, you have to go and spoil everything. <laughs> oh, honey. I think it's wonderful, really. I'll be glued to the radio. I wouldn't miss hearing it for the world. Well, don't worry. You won't. You're going to be in it, and so are the Atterbury. What? We have to furnish our own cast, all amateurs. Well, count me out. I'm not appearing on any radio show. Oh, George, who will I get? The part calls for a handsome, dashing adventurer who sweeps all the girls off their feet with his great personal charm. Well, what are you standing there for? Let's call the Atterbury's and get started. <laughs> Well, I sure appreciate it, Iris. Uh, a lot of silly foolishness dragging me out on a cold night to be in some silly play. Don't let him kid you, Liz. As soon as I told him about it, he pushed me aside, ran up to the attic, and started looking for his tights. <laughs> Shouting at the top of his lungs, to be or not to be. Please, please, Iris, that's not the way to say it. To be or not to be. That is the question. <laughs> Yes, dear, but not Whether now. it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Rudolph. To die. <laughs> to sleep. No more. That's right, Rudolph. No more. <laughs> Lotus bud. 
<laughs> look, look, everybody, let's get started, huh? Now, here are the scripts. See, it's a mystery soap opera entitled John's Other Whistler. <laughs> Well, that's uh, quite a title. Oh, thank you. Now, Miss Atterbury, you play the whistler. Oh, bad casting. He's got the weakest pucker in town. Iris. <laughs> well, he doesn't have to whistle. Now, George. I know, I'm John. Yes, an elderly gentleman, 75 years old, who gets killed at the end of the first act. <laughs> now, Iris, Just you... a minute. You said I had the leading part. You have. You're lying right there the whole time. <laughs> we talk about you. Iris, you play John's wife, 73-year-old Madge. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, John, we sure got stuck. We sure did. I'll be dead blamed. All right, let's start uh, now. Now, uh, Just a minute. What does the whistler sound like? Oh, you know, uh, uh, so you thought you'd get away with it, eh, Madge? Oh, yes, yes, I remember, yeah. You walk into the room, don't you, Madge? And there on the floor is a boom-boom dead man. Uh, what's that boom-boom business? Well, I don't know, but if there isn't a boom-boom, it isn't a whistler. Now, here we go. Well, what are you going to do, Liz? Well, don't worry about me. Besides being the writer, I'm also the director, the producer, the sound effects man, incidental voices, and the music. Oh, pardon me. Orson? <laughs> go ahead, George. You'll be the announcer. Okay. <clears throat> Presenting John's Other Whistler. Written, produced, directed, edited, sound effected, and musicked by Liz Cooper. <laughs> supposed to go. Oh, isn't this exciting, Rudolph? Oh, just another opening night, Lotus Bud. Do you have a sore leg, Mr. Atterbury? You're walking funny. Yeah. You won't believe it, but he's got his tights on under his pants. <laughs> what for? Well, I just wanted to be prepared, that's all. In case of an emergency, I can strip down and do Hamlet. <laughs> oh. oh, here comes Maggie. Hello, George. Iris, Rudolph, what are you doing here? I was waiting for a Miss Shakespeare. Speaking. You? Yes. Surprised, aren't you? Well, well, I scheduled your play first. We'd better go on to the studio. Okay, give us our scripts. Scripts? You're supposed to bring them with you. Oh, no. I thought you'd have them all typed and ready for us. Oh, dear, no scripts. What do we do? If I may make a suggestion, I'd be more than glad to give my rent... You keep your ham- pants on, Mr. Atterbury. <laughs> <laughs> I'll run home and get the script. No, there's no time for that. Your only chance is to go into one of these offices and type up copies. Okay, come on. Where's the typewriter? <laughs> Original radio script by Mrs. Virginia Hall. I said, and Mr. now, Mr. here's your scripts, everyone. I never typed so fast in my life. Mm. And now, our third and last script, written by Liz Cooper, entitled. Uh, may I have a script, please? Here. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Oh, no, no, no. I, I was practicing typing. The title's next. Oh. John's other whistler. Hmm. Well, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll do the sound effect. <clears throat> this is the story of John and Madge, two people who live together and loathe it. <laughs> As we look in on them today, Madge is saying... John, we've been married 65 years today, and there's something I think you should know. What? I don't like you. <laughs> Well, I'll be dead blamed. 
<laughs> I love you. You got a face like a camel. <laughs> See that? That's cameo. Oh. That's it wrong. <laughs> You got a face like a cameo. Your mouth is like a rosebud. And your nose is continued on the next page. Direction, don't read that. Your nose is like a button. I don't care, I'm leaving. I got me another liver. <laughs> At my age, I get more use out of another liver. <laughs> Iris, will you please just read what's on the paper? Now go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, John. My mind's made up. Yes, your mind's made up, isn't it, Madge? You're going to kill John and collect the insurance, aren't you, Madge? I know the nameless... Terriers? Terrors. Terrors of the night. For I am... The Whistler. Liz, you have a sound effect here. Oh, I forgot. Take it again. Yeah. For I am the whistler. <laughs> and John, your wife is leaving you. What have you to say to that? What have you to say to that? <laughs> Nothing. My line's been left out. <laughs> For my line, Liz. All right. Horace, I hear doorbell. Liz. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Liz. Horace, I hear a doorbell. Oh. <laughs> doorbell, doorbell. Mm -hmm. Horace, I hear an auto horn. <laughs> Never mind. I got the doorbell. <laughs> I wonder who that can be, John. You wonder who that can be, John, don't you, Madge? <laughs> so do I. That's the last page I've got. Say something. Yeah. To be or not to be. <laughs> that's the question, isn't it, Madge? Rudolph. I think that's enough of this. That's not in the script. I know it. But we haven't finished. Oh, yes, you have. Our time is running out. I have the judge's decision in this envelope. The prize for the best play goes to the comedy written by... Liz Cooper. Oh. Well, I'll be dead blamed. You're a genius. How'd you ever learn to write comedy? Oh, there's nothing to it. You just write it serious and type it in a hurry. <laughs> yes, Lucille. What, what's the ticket tonight? Tonight, Bob, we are going psychological. You are a hypnotist, and I am your subject. A little psychological music, men. Ah, uh, you must be the subject they sent over for my experiment. I'm going to hypnotize you and change your personality. No. <laughs> yes. Now read this. Uh... Hello. That's Jello. Oh. I wonder why Hello came in six delicious flavors. You can't taste Hello. 
a word. I know. Now, if you'll just Hello. take... Hello. Hello. Can't taste a thing. I know, I know. It's Jell-O. Jell-O comes in six delicious flavors. Strawberry, raspberry, cherry, orange, lemon, and lime. Okay, if you say so. All right. now, 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 just look me in the eyes. You are drowsy. Your head is getting heavier and heavier. Your eyes are closing. Your head is getting heavier. 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 What was that? My head, it slipped right out of my hand. If you hadn't made me close my eyes, I might have caught it. Well, you're hypnotized, all right. All right, now, now you're a scintillating French girl. Ooh la la. Now read this. Oh. Ooh la la. <laughs> Jello makes you think of the real ripe fruit itself. Ooh la la. No, no. Ooh la la. <laughs> For the big red letters on the ooh la la box. <laughs> Jello is so wonderful because the ooh la la flavor is ooh la locked in. You can't get out till your first delicious spoo la la oonful. I, I suppose you know how you sounded. Yeah, ooh la lousy. <laughs> been listening to My Favorite Husband, starring Lucille Ball with Richard Denning, and based on characters created by Isabel Scott Rorick. Tonight's transcribed program was produced and directed by Jess Oppenheimer, who wrote the script with Madeline Pugh and Bob Carroll, Jr. Be sure to listen to Lucille Ball in My Favorite Husband again next week, presented by... <laughs>